Which was the greatest navy of World War II? While Uncle Sam riding an aircraft carrier might seem like the obvious answer, have you ever wondered how is this represented in Hearts of Iron 4? Or can Japan and the UK compete with the US? Or what would happen if Germany and the Soviets decided to duke it out in the Baltic Sea instead of the Eastern Front? To answer these and many more questions, we'll take a deep dive into Hoi 4's most esoteric field and examine every major navy on a molecular level. To top it all off, we'll put it all together and make a tier list for the ages. By the end of this, you'll not only know how every country ranks, but also how to use its strong sides to rule the seas. We're gonna set sail with the starting fleet of each major. Having a strong head start is crucial because expanding your navy takes much more time compared to the air force or army. There's going to be spreadsheet goodness here as we need to keep track of all the numbers. So let's start with the USA, everyone's betting favorite. This major starts the game with a total of three aircraft carriers, with two of them being older hulls converted from battleships and one being a contemporary 36 model. What's interesting here is that the two older models, the Lexington and Saratoga, have a longer range of 4,000 kilometers as opposed to the 3,000 kilometer range of the Ranger. That's just the specific of the hull design, but as you can see, the production cost of older models is higher compared to the 36 one. So if you're gonna build carriers from the start, it's still better to use the newer hull. Besides, you don't have screening ships that can go up to 4,000 kilometers from the start, as you need to research the 1940 light cruiser hull to match that range. The 36 ones go up to 3K, which is the range of the new carrier that you have. Still, it's nice to know that the older carriers you already Already have aren't going to be obsolete in mid to late game. The total deck capacity for carrier planes here is 180 and you have an unused slot on the 36 model so you can add an extra hangar for 20 more airplanes. This will take 130 days to complete and I feel like it might be worth it as the refit will also contribute to leveling up your carrier Mio. Furthermore, you do have two additional 36 carriers that are in production, so we can also refit them to get an extra 40 planes when they are complete. The US also starts with 15 battleships, all of which are pre-36 models. There's not a huge difference between the variants, but the Colorado class has the highest attack and HP stats. There's also 15 heavy cruisers for you, 7 of which are contemporary, while the other 8 are older. The differences here are slightly higher combat stats as well as higher HP and range for the newer models. Keep in mind that the newer heavy cruisers have zero experience so they will take more time to train up to level 3, but all of the other ships that we've looked at are 25% away from level 3, although it's fair to say that the US has plenty of time and resources for naval exercises to increase your naval experience which can help you with doctrines and upgrading your meals and whatnot. Out of the 12 light cruisers, 10 on 1936 models while the rest are of the Oglala class that can also lay mines. In terms of destroyers you have a whopping 113 of them but keep in mind they are old and with pretty limited range. Still they can be used for convoy escorts as both the Clemson and the Farragut class come with depth charges. Keep in mind that the Clemson class DDs which are the vast majority majority of them don't have the all-important submarine spotting sonar, so you might want to refit them if you're gonna use them for convoy protection. It takes a short time and again gives experience to the MIO of your choice. I'd recommend using the Brooklyn Naval Yard as it does have specific bonuses for anti-sub warfare and a 5% bonus to production output, but you can also level up your carrier focus Mio and get an extra 5% HP on the destroyers. In terms of submarines, you have 71 of them, but only 12 are 1936 models that have the nice 4000 km range. All of your subs have a free spot for a torpedo or mine laying module, which again doesn't take that much time to refit, so feel free to upgrade some or all of them if you want a stronger raiding fleet and a more experienced Mayo. In total, the US has 229 ships from the start. 
33 of which are capital. There's also some ships in production, and the way I've calculated it here is that I've left all ships that are partially produced in the country's production line and set the ships per line to one. I don't have control over which ones you cancel, so I thought this is the fairest way of measuring it. Including the ships in production, you are looking at 243 ships in total, 38 of which are capital. Most impressive starting fleet indeed. Now we're moving our periscopes to the other heavy hitter on the list, the UK. Britain starts the game with a whopping 5 carriers, all of which are pre-1936 models with that nice 4000 km range. This translates to a deck space that can carry a combined 240 planes, which is the highest in the game. Still, one of the ships here, the HMS Hermes, is a converted cruiser hull which can only carry a maximum of 40 planes and you have to construct an additional deck space for that as well. Also the HMS Eagle has additional space for a hangar so you can make it carry up to 60 planes if you wish. Lastly, the three Courageous class ships here all come with 60 deck space so they're maxed out. As for battleships, the Brits have 12 of them. All pre-36 models in three different classes, sort of like what we saw with the US Navy. Additionally, UK players have three battlecruisers of their disposal, the most impressive of which is the HMS Hood, which is the hardest hitting of them all and has the highest HP. On top of that, you have 16 heavy cruisers. Again, no 1936 units here, everything is built on an early ship hull. Compared to the US, the UK has a numerical and quality advantage in screening ships with 130 destroyers and 31 light cruisers. It's interesting to note that 20 of your destroyers, the EFGH class, are actually 1936 models and come with depth charges and sonars installed. The older ABCD class also has a, a sonar as well, so about 40% of your destroyer fleet is actually ready to protect your convoys from the start. And you can install a sonar on the rest of them if you wish to do so. Now you might want to separate your earlier and more modern destroyers as you can see the 1936 destroyers have greater range and will cover some areas better. If you want to lay mines you only have a single light cruiser to work with although it does have a fully stacked 3 mine laying modules here. The rest of them, well, you do have uh, nine who were built on a 1936 hull while the rest are older models. As for submarines, there are 42, all of which are older models, although the S-Class, as you can see, is fully stacked with torpedo uh, slots here. The rest are not, you can add one if you wish. The production queue, it's full of screening ships, a couple of subs, and a 1936 carrier that's admittedly not that close to uh, completion. Taking everything together, the British have a total of 255 ships, 12 more than the US, and 37 capital ships which are a part of the 255 that I mentioned earlier. I would say that the UK starts the game in a slightly stronger position than America if we were to judge it solely or only by this parameter, which of course we're not. But you know, we gotta give credit where credit is due. Now it's time for the threat from the east, Japan. The Japanese fleet starts the game with four aircraft carriers. One more than the US, one fewer than the UK. Only the Ryujo is built on a 36 airframe and has deck space of 40 planes with however spots for two more so you can double its carrying capacity. Much like the UK we do have the Hosho here which is an escort carrier with a maximum of 40 slots for airplanes but you have to build an extra hangar here as well. Meanwhile the Kagi and Kaga class have a hangar space installed on 
each of their three available slots, which translates to a total carrying capacity of 180 airplanes for the Japanese carrier fleet from the start. The production queue has a 1936 Soryu class that's 16% complete. These come with three uh, hangars installed and a Zuiho class, which will have 40. So overall, the Japanese are definitely not doing bad in terms of carrier airplanes. In terms of battleships, we see that there are six of them here, so twice as fewer compared to the UK and the US, and even more, I think, in the case of the US because the US has 15. Again, they are built on early heavy ship hulls, so no modern BBs here. As for heavy cruisers and battle cruisers, we do have, sorry, uh, we do have three battle cruisers and here we have six early heavy cruisers but then again we do have 10 modern heavy cruisers which means that the heavy cruiser fleet of the Japanese is the most modern of them all. These are quite impressive as they do boast a torpedo attack of 36 and are reasonably beefy as well. I've also noticed something quite interesting about the Japanese Navy. They do have four mine laying subs with a single mine mine laying module. In addition, you have three mine laying destroyers as well with two modules each and a whopping 17 light cruisers capable of laying mines. That's impressive because this is the major country that gets into a war the earliest in 1937, which means that you can start laying mines pretty early. As you know, you need to be at war to lay mines. In other words, by the time you start fighting the big boys, you can spam mines around the Pacific and the Indian Oceans to have a significant advantage during naval battles. Mines give you naval supremacy, making it harder for the enemy to invade your islands, and it increases the accident chance of enemy fleets, plus decreases their speed, making it harder for hostile ships to escape or engage you, which is a big deal. Of course, all of this goes out the window if you're playing in a multiplayer game that bans mines, but if that's not the case, you can go nuts or use it in single player if you're struggling against the Allies. In terms of pure numbers, the Japanese have 19 light cruisers, four of which are on a modern hull, and 94 destroyers in addition to 52 early submarines. Aside from the aforementioned two carriers, the Japanese production queue has a heavy cruiser that is about 15% done and a whole bunch of escorts and halfway done submarines. Putting everything together, we have a total fleet size of 260 six ships, 32 of which are capital ones. This is including the ones in production, without them it's 194 and 29. Another remarkable fact about the Imperial Japanese fleet is that it's one of the only couple of ones or perhaps the most experienced one when it comes to ships being above level 3. As you can see you have two carriers here that have level 3 and a bit more experience. The subs, you have some that are level 3 others that are close to level 3, some inexperienced ones, destroyers, again a lot of inexperienced ones, some level 3s as well, uh, and here we do have some green ones and some close to level 3, but as you can see there's a lot of level 3 ships which was something that we didn't see uh, with the uh, US and UK fleets. So now that we have a few navies to compare, let's go back to the tier list. I would say that the UK has the strongest starting fleet of them all, with the US coming as a close second. The Japanese, even though they do have a smaller fleet, they are not too far off and are certainly interesting, so I would give them a solid A tier here. With that then, let's check another Axis power, which is going to be Germany. As you can see, the Treaty of Versailles has sunk the dreams of German naval supremacy to the bottom of the Baltic Sea. This is the first time we see a massive difference in terms of naval power as the Kriegsmarine is in shambles in 1936. Zero carriers, two old battleships, two heavy cruisers that are quite beefy in all honesty. Uh, they do have quite a lot of manpower and the stats aren't too bad for a heavy cruiser. It's more like a battle cruiser to be honest. Moving on, we have eight light cruisers, five of which are capable of laying mines and around five of the newer models built on the 1936 hull. All 12, yeah 12, of the available destroyers are inexperienced, old but can lay mines, so 
I think you should use them for that because you're gonna need every advantage. You also have 14 subs that you can use to harass the allies, even though they're not that impressive. Germany can build and usually does build better subs for this. In the queue, we do have what? Let's see. Some older submarines being built close to completion, some destroyers, and another panzer shift here, the Deutschland class, that's what, 90-95% close to completion, some cruisers, a couple of heavy ships here, which are the Scharnhorst class, which is, I think, yep, it's a battle cruiser, and some destroyers as well that are 1936 models. So yeah, the Kriegsmarine will need a lot of love and foreign dockyards if you want to compete with the big boys. Sorry Germany, but that's D tier for you and all of the ships that you have in the construction queue don't make a huge difference as well. In total, Germany with everything has 47 ships with a rather impressive, I would say, ratio of 8 capital ships. So if you can build some screens for your capitals, I mean, you could do something, but these are going to be mostly convoy raiders otherwise. Now let's see if Italy is doing any better. I would say that Team Mussolini sports a proper mid-sized fleet, no carriers and only two battleships, with no battle cruisers to mention. Still, eight heavy cruisers are online, with one of them being on a 1936 hull. And the 82 destroyers, 19 of which are capable of laying mines, are not too shabby. You also have 51 subs, to help you harass allies in the Mediterranean and two early battleships that are 17-ish percent complete in the queue. Aside from the totally inexperienced submarine fleet, the rest of the ships are almost all close to level 3. So getting some nice stat bonuses won't require much exercise. Overall, the Italians have 160 ships with 14 of them being capital ones, which includes the ones in production. We're moving over to the Red Menace, the Soviet Union. It's certainly not an impressive fleet for a country of this size, with a total of 85 vessels, including the ones in production. Here we're working with three older battleships, no carriers or heavy cruisers, five multi-purpose light cruisers capable of mine laying, 18 early destroyers, and 59 submarines, nine of which are 1936 models. The entire Soviet fleet has zero experience, so if you want to do something with them, best to train them up beforehand. Yeah, it's bad, but I'd argue it's not as bad as the Kriegsmarine, so if the two somehow magically fight in the beginning of the game, Germany won't have enough screens to protect its capital ships from torpedoes, so the Soviets should win. Finally, we have the major nobody cares about, France. I'm kidding, I love you. Outside of the top three, France arguably has the best navy, boasting a single aircraft carrier and five battleships. Seven heavy cruisers complete the mix, and seven is also the number of light cruisers available, none of which are modern. The French definitely don't have as many destroyers compared to their Italian neighbors, because they have 52, I think the Italians have, what, 80, 82? But 52 is still pretty decent considering the likely alliance with Britain Britain, which has a lot of other ships as well. What did impress me is that France has the best submarine fleet from the start, with 63 vessels, 21 of which are 1936 models with that impressive 4000 kilometer range and double torpedo tubes. For whatever reason, Paradox has left the entire French fleet inexperienced, and in terms of production, the French queue is full of partly produced screens. A couple of uh, 1936 battleships, which I think are the only ones in the game, and some cruisers and some submarines as well. Overall, we have 150 ships plus the ones in production, with 15 of them being capital ships. To round off the tier list, I would say that the Soviets go in C tier, as the Navy is slightly better than Germany, while France gets the first B tier and Italy also is in B tier. These are comparable navies, I would say. With starting fleet out of the way, we're going to look at two other categories and conclude what is going to be part one of a multi-part series. Yeah, I wasn't kidding around when I said that we're going to look at everything. Next up, we do have a tab that I call Strategic Naval 
assessment. This is a short and much more subjective tab as I'm assuming these countries will have a close to historical playthrough with the traditional factions fighting against each other. You don't have to agree with me here and if it doesn't apply to your alt history scenario feel free to ignore what I have to say. Still it's important to get a grasp on the motivation of each major to build a grand navy. I've written down four questions that will help us figure this out and there's also a resource and in industry category that we'll take a look at later. The first and most important question is, is a large navy essential for the country to achieve its main World War II strategic goals? With the answer yes, awarding six points, kinda, which is somewhere in the middle, awarding three points, and no, awarding zero points. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, having a large navy essentially is the ability to project power far away from your home home shores. This definitely applies to the USA as most of the action happens in Europe and Asia. While the UK can single-handedly manage the European theater, the Japanese are a different story and you can't invade their islands without naval supremacy. The UK and Japan also score 6 points here as one needs to protect its home front and global colonial empire while the other one needs to attack it or parts of it at least. As for Germany, I've awarded the country 3 points as Britain is a thorn in its side and needs to be taken care of at some point. Granted, the subjugation of Europe is its main strategic goal Goal, but having a hostile island close to your empire was Germany's strategic and historical undoing and it deserves consideration. I also gave Italy three points here as it does have colonies in Africa so having control of the Mediterranean is important. I admit that you can access Southern Europe, Asia Minor, the Middle East and Africa. Still, we do have the Bosphorus straight crossing here, so you need a navy to protect it for your units to pass, but I would argue that the initial starting navy of Italy with an element of surprise might be enough. As for the Soviets in France, there is the immediate threat of Axis invasion and no navy will save you from that. The Soviets can conquer three continents without building a single ship due to their massive borders and access to everywhere which can also be said about a more aggressive French path. Therefore, they get zero points. Question number two is, is the country an island or does it have similar characteristics? The USA gets a yes here, and even though it's obviously not an island, it has two massive oceans on either side and no big continental threats in a historical scenario. As for the UK and Japan, obviously these are islands that need a adequate navy for offense and defense. The third question is access to colonies and bases around the world. In other words, these are places where you can park ships and that need defending if they are of strategic importance. The US has a bunch of Pacific islands to take care of as well as a Philippine puppet, so it does score three points. As for the UK, it has the largest colonial empire on earth and lots of puppets in addition to its own territory in every continent more or less, so it's definitely a yes. Japan's many Pacific islands are important for its defense, but immediate access to other continents aside from Oceania here is limited so they get a single point. Germany is pretty much stuck in Europe so it doesn't get any points. Italians have Libya and Ethiopia after it's conquering so they do get a point. The Soviets simply due to their sheer size have access to a lot of seas, different ones in Europe and the Pacific Ocean and are quite close to North America as well so they do get a single point point here, while well, France is in a similar position to the UK. And the last question, question number four, can the country rely on superior naval support from its allies? Assuming the historical factions, the US and UK benefit from each other but still need naval improvement, so I left both as kind of, which takes away a point here. As for Japan, it is the Axis power tasked with taking the colonies of the allies and the other two navies won't provide it with much assistance aside from forcing the Brits to divide their own fleet. Still the question is, does it benefit from superior allied naval support 
support which Japan doesn't because the Japanese do the heavy lifting for the Axis. This is why I've awarded three points as further motivation for Japan to expand navally. Conversely, the Germans have largely exported the big naval war to their allies in the Far East, so it does benefit from superior allied naval support. Meanwhile, Italy has to largely fend for itself in the European theater, so it also gets three points. As for France and the Soviets, both countries have no choice but to face the Axis on land and have the benefit of the US and UK fighting the fascist threat at sea, so there's not much motivation to build a fleet. Again, if you play ahistorically, this strategic assessment won't necessarily apply, so I won't hold it against you if you totally disagree here. Our points total has Japan on top with 14 points, sending it to S tier, with the UK and US close behind with 12 points each, going into A tier. I would personally put Italy into C tier as it only gets 7 points, while Germany, the Soviets and France all go into the last D tier, as their circumstances don't really create a huge need for a grand fleet. Of course, you as the player and single player especially can choose to do that either way, but in a more competitive environment, I think this applies quite well. Lastly, we have the starting industry and resources tab. I will zip past these as I want to keep the video under 30 minutes to maintain our communal sanity. I will upload the uh, spreadsheets as well to the video. So if anyone is curious and wants to have the data on hand, uh, they're welcome to download it. So free industrial coastal slots. This is measured by researching 1937 concentrated industrial tech for all major the US sits at second place with 86, its average infrastructure levels across these provinces is 63%, the US also has the largest amount of dockyards available 22 and the best dockyard output at 30% because of its free trade policy and high stability. What's amazing about the US is that it also starts with 128 civilian factories which is by far the most, however due to the Great Depression national spirit and and the undisturbed isolation economic law, you have a massive amount of these factories going towards consumer goods. So you do have around 23 factories that are effectively constructing dockyards at the same speed as the rest of the majors, because undisturbed isolationism is the only economic policy that has a penalty to the construction speed of dockyards, and it is a massive one at 50%. The US has also obscene amounts of oil, the most steel and no chromium but it can easily trade for that as well. So it deserves an S tier. The UK as well as France have the most free industrial coastal slots available the way I've measured it. Uh, UK also has a very decent average infrastructure level, the second place in dockyards with 19 of them and a decent 19% dockyard output bonus. With the civilian economy you have 18 of your 31 factories available and the British have decent but maybe not enough oil it does usually trade for it later in the game decent amounts of steel and more than enough chromium to go around so it deserves an A tier for Japan you have 62 free industrial coastal slots the lowest however infrastructure average of 53.6 percent lots of islands and some areas of mainland Japan are at 40 percent so it does bring it down 14 dockyard with really decent 23% dockyard output due to the incredibly high stability of the country and although you have a rather low 22 civilian factories you can go into war economy and total economic mobilization rather easily with focuses which means that you can get up to 21 of these working for you in terms of oil Japan doesn't have any to speak of steel it is rather low I would say not enough and chromium I would say it is enough putting Japan in the C tier. Germany, only 21 industrial coastal slots available for you to build dockyards, not that many, I think it's by far the lowest number here. Still really good infrastructure, 10 dockyards with 18% dock output, 33 civilian factories, really decent with 26 or 27 of them depending on your economic law available. No oil, not enough I feel steel because you do have uh, your army to take care of as well, but still there is some and barely any chromium. 
Union putting it in C tier. As for Italy, uh, only 43 industrial coastal slots with the way I measured it. A rather low, I would say, uh, infrastructure at 56.25%, but not as bad compared to uh, Japan, the Soviet Union or France. 15 dockyards, but a minus 2 debuff to dockyard output. 21 civilian factories with 11 or 13 available. No oil to speak of, low amounts of steel and barely any chromium. The Soviet Union, right after the UK and the USA and France, it has 67 free coastal slots available for you, with many of these being around the Black Sea in today's Ukraine. The infrastructure level is low at 54%. You have a miserly 6 dockyards, I would say, with a minus 11% debuff to your dockyard output, so this is really bad. Still, you do have pretty decent civilian factories and you can use 24, 29 of them, depending on your economic law and even more with trading. The US has a lot of trade, the UK has a lot of trade, the Soviets have a lot of trade, and the French have decent amounts of trade as well. In terms of oil, the Soviets have enough, I would say, to sustain a navy at 207, 570 steel, really good amounts, and more than enough chromium for its navy. Lastly, we have France, again, first place with the UK in terms of free industrial coastal slots, rather low infrastructure levels on par with Japan, more or less. This is largely because of its uh, colonies. You can build dockyards, not many of them in many of the uh, offshore areas, but in mainland France, you do have some pretty decent infrastructure alongside the northern coast, especially. Dockyards, you have 11 of them, but with minus 10% debuff due to the low stability there. In terms of civilian factories, 33 of them, 19 of which are available with civilian industry. No oil to speak of for France. Again, you can trade with your allies for it, but still you're going to take away precious civilian factories for that to happen. Really, really good amounts of steel, though the second highest after the US, and enough chromium to go around for the construction of a navy. So in terms of resources and starting industry, the US comes first, the Brits are in the A tier, I would say that France and the Soviet Union are very decent in B tier, and then we have Japan and Germany in the C tier, Italians coming in last. And there we have it folks, this concludes part 1 of our extensive naval review. Before we go over what's next, if you've loved what you see, remember to like and subscribe to the channel, it really means a lot. For part two of the video, we'll take a really close look at the focus tree, national spirits, military industrial organizations, research and technology, mid to late game scenarios, and I'm also going to buy the latest expansion because I saw that there is a rework of the naval leaders. I still don't know if I'll be able to do everything in one video to keep it reasonably short, but feel free to let me know how you find this type of content. Also, I'm not claiming my my scoring is perfect, so any constructive criticism and good suggestions will be considered when I continue. Thank you all for watching and see you soon!